Welcome to the 27th session of our New Testament series. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we continue in the Acts of the Apostles. We're now up to chapter 6. In the first five chapters, we heard that the book is uh, the second book by Luke, the author, whoever he might be. And also that is directed to a certain Theophilus can mean lover of God, an individual, or possibly all of us who read the book. It talks about the beginnings of the early of the church. And the beginnings are important because what they have to do is to take the message of Jesus and apply it to a community, the community of disciples. Jesus has shared his message with his apostles, but now they have to take that message and say, now how do we live Jesus' message as a community without the physical presence of Jesus with us. And so that's what the community is attempting to do and what it does do in the early church. So now we come to chapter six. One of the things to keep in mind is that even though the church is now beginning to pick up Christ's message, it's still made up of human beings. It's made up of people with the daily needs of life people who have the daily challenges of life, people who are trying to figure out things, and people who have the certain weaknesses of life. And so it's all part of the human Im image trying to live as a community. So it begins now, they're trying to say, well, what do they do to make sure that everybody is taken care of? So chapter six. At that time, the number of disciples continued to grow. And the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And so the twelve called together the community of disciples and said, It is not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve a table. So first of all, the Hellenists. The Hellenists they were people who were Jewish or people who came into Judaism, but who spoke Greek. They couldn't speak Hebrew. They didn't understand Hebrew. They didn't understand Aramaic. And at that time, there was a certain kind of a prejudice, or perhaps maybe even better, a bias among the Hebrew-speaking Jews that they would tend to take better care of the Hebrew-speaking Jews. And a little bit of jealousy and some kind of prejudice at times against those who were simply Greek-speaking Jews because most of them were influenced by some of the customs of the Jewish, of the Greek world. So there was that little bit of an animosity. But then what happens now, they're trying to live together as a community. But then the Hellenists, Greek-speaking Jews, they begin to complain that the daily distribution is not quite fair they feel they're getting less than the others. So the squabble. The 12 apostles say, well, it's not fair for us to have to stop what we're doing to take care of these matters. So let us now come to a conclusion. Kind of let us come to an idea of how to do this. So they say, brothers and sisters, select from among you seven reputable men filled with the spirit of wisdom whom we shall appoint to this task, whereas we shall devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It almost recalls the time when Moses had the Israelites out into the desert. And he was keeping busy or being kept busy by people coming to him with complaints. And Moses' father-in-law is saying, you're too busy to take care of everybody's complaint. So select so many men to act as judges, and only in very severe cases 
should people come to you? And so now it arises again. I have a community. Here they are. And the apostles are saying, well, really, we have other things to do. We can't just spend our time trying to take care of these small squabbles within the community. So let's select seven men. So it's, there's seven men, not just to serve a table. That's, not, that's what the imagery here is. They're not just simply waiters. The idea being is that they are meant to set down how the food is to be distributed and how other things are to taken care of. The Hellenists, Greek-speaking Jews, they're complaining. They're complaining that the others are being taken care of better than we are. So the proposal was accepted, choosing men, seven men. So they chose Stephen, a man filled with faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip. They call them deacons uh, later on in history, those who serve. But at the same time, it's not exactly that. Actually, they don't just serve at tables. We'll see now that they're going to go out and preach. There's others, there's seven of them, so Stephen, Philip, and others, five others. And so these are people who are meant to serve strictly the Greek-speaking Jews. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. Laying hands on them was the church's way of passing on power. And so they were passing on the power of the church of Christ onto these men who were chosen to serve a part of the community. The word of the God, of word of God continued to spread. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly. Even a large group of priests were becoming obedient to the faith. What was happening, again, in the Acts of the Apostles, is see the gradual growth of the church. And now what was happening, even those who serve in the temple, the priests, the priests, the Jewish priests, they were now converting also. Up to this point, they still saw themselves as the fulfillment of the Jewish religion. So they didn't see themselves as starting a new religion. What was happening now, they were beginning, beginning to set up a situation where there were new things happening in the community that weren't part of the older community of Judaism. Now Stephen, filled with grace and power, was working great wonders and signs among the people. So now through the apostles, through the gift that they laid hands on them, Stephen now began to do the work of the church, the work of Christ really in many ways. He continued to work miracles. But then there was a group that really became jealous of him and at the same time unhappy with what they saw happening. And so they tried to bring Stephen before the Sanhedrin. They then investigated some men and instigated them to say, we've heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. So now they're accusing him. It recalls Jesus coming before the Sanhedrin at the time of his persecution. They stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. They seized him and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They presented false witnesses. The false witnesses testified, this man never stops saying things against this holy place and law. For we have heard him preach and claim that this Jesus is a Nazarene will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses handed down to us. All those who sat in the Sanhedrin looked intently at him and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. In the Old Testament, we read about Moses going up the mountain. He sees God, actually the back of God, but sees God. When he comes down the mountain, his face glows, reflects the glory of God. And the people can't look upon him. And now it says the face of Stephen looks like the face of an angel. 
Then Stephen gives the longest discourse found in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. So chapter 7, Stephen begins to talk to the people. And he tell, begins with the whole history of the Israelite nation. He shows his knowledge and his pride in being a Jew. He talks about Abraham and how Abraham was chosen by God to come and take over the land. He didn't possess the land, but he was shown land. And then he talks about the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then the sons of Jacob, and how they wound up in Egypt, how Joseph brought them on into Egypt, and how after so many years, 100, 400 years, the Pharaoh by that time didn't know how they got there, who they were. He didn't know the story of Joseph. And the Pharaoh had been several generations of Pharaohs. So now the Pharaoh simply put them into slavery. Then they escaped from Egypt. Moses leads them on through the desert, brings them on into the promised land. And in the promised land, they established their kingdom. Kings like Saul and David and Solomon going to build a house for the Lord. And so he's telling them all these stories about how the people moved along. He gives a synopsis of the Old Testament story. And the idea behind that, he's showing the relationship of what he is saying to the relationship of God, how God had planned all these things. And then he talks about the idea, the Most High does not tell us when Solomon says, I'm going to build a house for the Lord. But he's saying, God really didn't establish that house fully. The heavens are my throne, the Lord says to the mouth of the prophet. What kind of house can you build for me? Did not my hand make all these things? We see a transition taking place. The temple was the center of Judaism. But now Stephen comes along. He talks about the historical development and he says it's still going on. What's happening now, we're moving beyond the, temp the temple. And now he looks at everybody and says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always oppose the Holy Spirit, just like your ancestors did. When he calls them uncircumcised in heart, what he really means is that they're physically doing what Judaism calls them to do. But spiritually, they're not like Jews. They haven't dedicated themselves fully, only in body. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? And he's kind of giving them a little bit of a warning. Whenever people in the scriptures speak about God, they always are persecuted. They put to death those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, who those who are betrayers and murderers. They're the same thing now. You become that. You receive the law as transmitted by angels, but you did not observe it. When they heard this, they were infuriated, and they ground their teeth at him. But Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked up intently to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. In the Gospel of Mark, he tells us that you will look to the heavens and see the Son of God standing at the right hand of God. And Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out in a loud voice, covered their ears, and rushed together against him. They threw him out of the city. When Jesus was crucified, they made him go out of Jerusalem. He carried his cross out of Jerusalem. They threw him out of the city and began to stone Stephen. The witnesses laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul, who was to become Paul the Apostle. As they were stoning Stephen, Stephen called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 
when Jesus died. Lord, into your hands I commend my spirit. Then Stephen fell to his knees and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Jesus from the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What the author has done here, he's paralleled the death of Stephen with the, with the death of Jesus. He's saying, prophets will suffer this way. And now Stephen is bringing about the message of Christ. He is bringing it alive from the community that Jesus is still alive with them. Chapter 8. Now Saul was consenting to this execution. Later on, we'll read about how bad Saul was to the Christian community at the beginning. Saul persecuted them. It said he, he supported the death of them, being put to death, supported by Paul. So Paul becomes an atrocious name among the early Christians. On that day, there broke out a severe persecution of the church in Jerusalem. And all were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea, and Samaria, except the apostles. It was a persecution in Jerusalem. And the persecution seems to be against the Hellenists, those who were Greek-speaking Jews, they couldn't speak Hebrew. Those who could speak Hebrew, Aramaic, the persecution didn't seem to be against those, even though they professed faith in Christ. So the apostle could stay in Jerusalem. But the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, they had to leave. They had to scatter for their life. And it says that they go to the countryside of Judea and Samaria. In the Acts of the Apostles, Samaria is treated very lovingly. And perhaps as we realize, they really lead to the conversions that begin almost immediately. One of the first ones to be converted are the Samaritans. And we look back at the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke shows favorable signs towards the Samaritans. Talks about the prejudice of the people against the Samaritans. But at the same time, he always speaks kindly about them. It is the good Samaritan story that is found only in Luke. So Luke realizes from his point when he's writing the future from the future, that the Samaritans have become, in many ways, a foundation of the church. So devout men buried Stephen after he was killed and made loud lament over him. Saul, meanwhile, was trying to destroy the church. He was entering house after house and dragging out men and women. He handed them over for imprisonment. So Paul, Saul is building up a reputation of a very, very staunch persecutor of the church. So the mission in Judea and Samaria. Now those who have been scattered went about preaching the word. The interesting thing about the spread of Christianity from the beginning is that persecution actually forced the spread of Christianity. They had to leave and they took the faith with them. They went to other areas. They didn't stop believing. They took the faith into these other areas. So those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Thus Philip, he went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. With one accord, the crowd paid attention to what he said. And when they heard it, saw the signs he was doing. They began to believe. For unclean spirits crying out in a loud voice came out, of, came out of many possessed people. And many paralyzed and crippled people were cured. There was great joy in that city. Philip now is the one who shows the power, who is now sharing Christ's message. A man named Simon used to practice magic in the city and astounded the, astounded the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. In those days, they had magicians. 
and they would enjoy the magicians. And sometimes they felt that they really were sent by God in some way or the gods. All of them, from the least to the greatest, paid attention to Simon. They were saying, this man is the power of God. This is called great. They paid attention to him because he astounded them by his magic for a long time. But once they began to believe Philip as he preached about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, men and women alike were baptized. Even Simon himself believed and after being baptized became devoted to Philip. And when he saw the signs and mighty deeds that were coming, he was astounded. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent them Peter and John. The center of early Christianity was Jerusalem. And so sending out Peter and John, the church was moving out from Jerusalem. We saw about the uh, first of all, Stephen, Philip, how the church had to scatter and went outside Jerusalem. Now it reached the stage where Peter and John now come from outside Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to the outside. They went down and prayed for the Samaritans that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For it had not yet fallen upon them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's rather strange. Some of the ideas we see. We have baptism without the Holy Spirit. Later on, we'll have the Holy Spirit before baptism. We'll talk about that part when we get to it. But it shows how the church is acting. It gives a message. So then Peter and John, they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit in Samaria. They've been baptized, but now later they receive the Holy Spirit. The idea here is that the Spirit comes through the church. Jesus said, I'll baptize you with water and spirit. It doesn't necessarily mean at this time that this happens immediately. But the Spirit is given through the church. And so either it comes through the church or happens in the presence of the church. So the Holy Spirit now, they've received baptism, but now the Spirit comes upon them from Peter and John, representatives of the church from Jerusalem. When Simon saw this, Simon the magician, saw that the spirit was conferred by laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. He said, give me this power too, so that anyone upon whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your money perish with you, because you thought that you could buy the gift of God with money. We have a word in English, simony. Simony means paying money for a spiritual good. And that's really where the word comes from this episode in the Acts of the Apostles. Someone who tries to pay for a spiritual power. You have no share or lot in this matter, they say to Simon, for your heart is not upright before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord that if possible, your intention may be forgiven. For I see that you are filled with bitter gall, Peter says, and are in the bonds of iniquity. Simon said in reply, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So now he's frightened. He asked them to pray for him. He's repentant. So when they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem. Peter and John returned to Jerusalem and preached the good news to many Samaritan villages along their way. So it's a story of now the script, now Jesus' message is spreading. We see things happening. It's spreading out from Jerusalem. Then the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, get up and head south 
on the road that goes down to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Gaza, the desert road. So he got up and set out. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candice, that is the queen of the Ethiopians. And she was in charge of the entire treasury and she put him in charge of it. And he had come from Jerusalem to worship. He was returning home. He was someone who might be called a God-fearer. A God-fearer were those who became Jewish, followed the Jewish faith, but not all of it. They were exempt from certain things within Judaism. So he's on his way home from Jerusalem. And God brings Philip to him. And the thing about a eunuch, a eunuch was castrated. He was a servant of the king and was castrated, was part of the office. He was a treasurer. And so what happened is that on his way home, he was now seated, he was treated well, a high official. But he could not fully become a Jew. It was contrary to Judaism for a eunuch to become fully a Jew. Excuse me. So he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, go up and join with the chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said to him, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone instructs me? So he invited Philip to get in and sit with him. This was the scripture passage he was reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will tell of his posterity? For his life is taken from the earth. Isaiah the prophet foretold is one of the suffering servants that Isaiah speaks about. And now Philip is to t t tell him that this is referring to Christ. That's who Isaiah is referring to. And then the eunuch said to Philip and replied, I beg you, about whom is the prophet saying this? About himself or somebody else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began with scripture passage and he proclaimed Jesus to him. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there is water. What is to prevent my being baptized? Then he ordered the chariot to stop. And Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more but continued on his way rejoicing. The implication here, the eunuch will now share the message of the new church. One of the images here again is that the church now is not only spread to Samaria, it's spread to the eunuch who represents paganism. The message is that now the church is reaching into the land of paganism. And so it's gradually spreading throughout the world. Philip came to another town, went about proclaiming the good news to all until he reached Caesarea. Chapter 9. Now Saul, still breathing murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, that if he should find any men or women who belong to the way, he might bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. The way. In the early church, as I mentioned before, the followers of Jesus, they, they referred to themselves as the way. They still saw themselves as good Jews. They saw themselves as the fulfillment of the Old Testament preparation for the coming of the Messiah. 
So they were the fulfillment of Judaism. And so they call themselves the way, the new way, actually. They didn't see themselves as separate or cut off. They weren't a new religion, a new kind of faith. And so that was the word they took, expecting others to recognize Jesus was the Messiah and they would all be converted to Jesus. On the journey, Saul was nearing Damascus when a light from the sky suddenly flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? An artist at some point in history saw Saul as falling from his horse. They have a picture of Saul below the horse. The scriptures don't tell us that he fell from a horse, just that he fell to the ground. And then he hears the voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The idea there that Jesus in the vision is identifying himself with Christians. Saul said, who are you, sir? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. This is the story of Saul's conversion. And one of the things we realize, Jesus is saying, you are persecuting me. Jesus is identifying himself with all Christians. It's the image now, beginning in Paul's mind perhaps, of the body of Christ. That Christians are joined together in the body of Christ. The men who were traveling with him, stood speechless, for they heard the voice, but could see no one. Later on, we'll read that they saw a light, but they heard nothing. That's an insignificant detail for the people of this day. The big thing is, somehow or other, they experienced something, but it wasn't fully what Saul experienced. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. He started out with the purpose of persecuting, capturing the people who were denying the Judaism, bringing them back for prison, Jewish Jews who were not following Judaism, especially the Hellenists. So for three days, Paul was unable to see and he neither ate nor drank. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, here I am, Lord. Just like Samuel, when he hears the Lord's voice, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and ask at the house of Judas, for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Judas seems to have been a pretty common name in the early church. And so we see many people, at least three or four, named Judas. And so again, a name of Judas. But this is not Judas Iscariot. So you'll find a man named Saul. He is there praying. And in a vision, Ananias saw a man, or Paul saw a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him, that he may regain his sight. But Ananias replied, Lord, I have heard from many sources about this man. What evil things he has done to your holy ones in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to imprison all who call upon your name. So he's saying to Jesus, Jesus now in heaven, that he's heard many things. And also he's talking to the vision he's having, the vision of the Lord. He's saying, how can I do this? But the Lord said to him, go, 
For this man is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. And I will show him what he will have to suffer for my name. So in being chosen, it's not always being lifted up. It's that person sometimes chosen to be willing to suffer to share Christ's message. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on him and said, Saul, my brother. Right away, he's inviting Saul into the community. Saul, my brother, the Lord has sent me. Jesus, who appeared to you on the way by which you came, that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, things like scales fell from Paul's eyes, and he regained his sight. He got up and was baptized, and when he had eaten, he recovered his strength. It's like he was three days in the tomb, three days without sight, and now suddenly he rises and he eats. Eating, again, is a symbol of life. He's back to life, and he regains his strength. So Saul stays some days with the disciples in Damascus and began at once to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue that he is the son of God. So Saul goes immediately to the synagogue. He doesn't go out and preach elsewhere. The synagogue, he's still a Jew. He's still hanging on to Judaism. And he's going to preach about Jesus in the synagogue. All who heard him were astounded and said, Is this not the man who in Jerusalem ravaged those who call upon this name? They came here expressly to take them back in chains to the chief priests. But Saul grew all the stronger and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus, proving that this is the Messiah. After a long time had passed, the Jews conspired to kill him. So you see now where they're beginning to develop a desire to continue killing those who profess faith in Christ. But their plot, they became known to Saul. Now they were keeping watch on the gates day and night so as to kill him. But his disciples took him one night and let him down through an opening in the wall lowering him in a basket. The houses were built in such a way in many places that they really were part of the outer wall. So the wall might be there put in, but then they'd build a house just with three other sides just to use the back wall, the wall that surrounded the city as a wall. And so what happens is they let him down through an opening in the wall. Could have been that way, could have been another way, but this was kind of a custom of ways of building in ancient times. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. They were afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. Then Barnabas took charge of him and brought him to the apostles. He reported to them how on the way he had seen the Lord and that he had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had spoken openly and boldly in the name of Jesus. He moved about freely with them in Jerusalem and spoke out boldly in the name of the Lord. So again, Barnabas. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, the one whose name originally was Joseph, but it was changed to Barnabas because of the encouraging spirit. He had put everything he owned, he sold all he owned, and gave the money to the community, became a primary preacher about Jesus, and greatly admired. And he was the one who took charge of Saul, Paul, when nobody else would. The word Saul, Saul is a Hebrew word, it's a Hebrew name. And later on, his name is not really changed, it's simply in another language, Greek language, Paul. So eventually, when he became more linked with the Greeks, they called him Paul. And that's how we know him, Paul the Apostle.
So he spoke, he spoke and debated with them as Barnabas is saying to the people. But they tried to kill him. So he wasn't really accepted yet by the Greek-speaking Jews. And when the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him on his way to Tarsus. So Saul preaches a while in Damascus, begins to get many converts, and yet the Jews get upset with him there, and so he has to escape. And now he goes to Jerusalem, and again, he preaches about Jesus, but he has to escape. He's thoroughly a Jew, a Jew who can speak Greek and Hebrew, probably. And at the same time, he's being treated as though he's a criminal in both places. So now he's sent to Tarsus. And now a small period of peace seems to come over the church. The church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria was at peace. It was being built up and walked in the fear of the Lord. And with the consolation of the Holy Spirit, it grew in numbers. Again, as we see continuing, every now and then, the growth of the church is mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles. As Peter was passing through every region, he went down to the Holy Ones living in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who had been confined to bed for eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Jesus Christ hears you. Get up and make your bed. So Jesus tells the paralytic, get up and take your mat. He says, get up and make your bed. He got up at once. And all the inhabitants saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was always completely occupied with good deeds and almsgiving. Almsgiving was very, very important in early church history. In fact, among the Jews, almsgiving was extremely important. Now, during those days, she fell sick and died. So after washing her, they laid her out in an upper room. Since it was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing what, that Peter was there, sent two men with him with the request, please come to us without delay. Peter got up and went with them back to Joppa. When he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs where all the widows came to him weeping and showing him the tunics and cloaks that Dorcas had made while she was with him. Peter sent them all out, knelt down and prayed. Then he turned to her body, to her body and said, Tabitha, rise up. She opened her eyes, saw Peter and sat up. He gave her his hand and raised her up. And when he had called the holy ones and the widows, he presented her alive. This became known all over Joppa. And many came to believe in the Lord. And he stayed a long time in Joppa with Simon, a tanner. Peter is breaking some rules here. He's saying with a tanner. He was, a tanner would be uh, continue, uh, considered unclean. And yet Peter stayed with him a few days. Chapter 10. Now in Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the cohort called the Italica. So he's a centurion. He had a cohort. He was Roman. He was devout and God-fearing, along with his whole household. Probably a God-fearer, used followed the Jews, lived according to the law, but didn't have to follow all their laws, such as perhaps circumcision or eating certain foods. He used to give alms to the Jewish people and pray to God constantly. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he saw plainly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. 
He looked intently at him and seized with fear said, what is it, sir? He said to him, your prayers and almsgiving have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Again, shows how important it was prayers and alms given, not just prayers, but the alms given, very important feature. Now send some men to Joppa and summon one Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with another Simon, a tanner, who has a house by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his, two of his servants and a devout soldier explaining everything to them and sent them to Joppa. The next day, while they were on their way and nearing the city, Peter went up on the roof of terrace to pray about noontime. So God comes to Cornelius in prayer. Now Peter is praying. He was hungry and wished to eat. And while they were making preparations for, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something resembling a large sheep coming, sheet coming down, lowered to the ground by four corners. In it were all the earth's four-legged animals and reptiles and birds of the sky. A voice said to him, get up, Peter, slaughter and eat. Peter said, certainly not, sir. sir for I have never eaten anything profane or unclean. The voice spoke to him again. What God has made clean, you are not to call profane. This happened three times, and then the object was taken up into the sky. Three times, scripturally, three times means definitively. It definitively happened. A definitive vision. While Peter was in doubt about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelia asked for si at Simon's Peter's house for Peter. They called out inquiring whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. As Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said, there are three men here looking for you. So get up, go downstairs and accompany them without hesitation because I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your being here? They told him Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, respected by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear what you had to say. So he invited them in and showed them hospitality. The next day, he got up and went with them and some of the brothers from Joppa, and they went to the house of Cornelius. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So it's not just the relatives of Cornelius, the close friends of Cornelius are there. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, paid him homage. Peter, however, raised him up saying, get up. I myself am also a human being. While he conversed with him, he went in and found many people gathered there. He said to them, you know that it's, it is unlawful for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call any person profane or unclean. And that's why I came without objection when sent for. May I ask you, why have you summoned me? Cornelius replied, four days ago at this hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, I was at prayer in my house when suddenly a man dazzling robes stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your almsgiving remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and summon Simon, who is called Peter. 
So I sent for you immediately, and you were kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all have here in the presence of God to listen to all you have been commanded by the Lord. Peter proceeded to speak and said, In truth, I see that God shows no partiality. In Moses' time, we see where Moses is able to say, God shows no partiality. So he tells about Jesus. He talks to them about uh, Peter tells them that they already know what happened to Jesus. Talks about Jesus being crucified and how he, on the third day he rose and how he commissioned the people to testify to him. And he says to him, all the prophets bear witness and everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to his word. The circumcised believers who accompanied Peter were astounded that the Holy Spirit should have been poured out on the Gentiles also. A change. The Gentiles are now being more and more invited into the church. They could hear them speaking in tongues and glorifying God. They received the total gift of the Holy Spirit. They praised God. Then Peter responded, can anyone withhold the water for baptism from these people? They've received the Holy Spirit, even as we have. He ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they invited him to stay for a few days. It doesn't tell us whether or not they stayed. They were invited. The message here is the idea that now... What's happening is those who were outside of Judaism, the Gentiles, they're now being invited into the faith. The faith has spread from Jerusalem to Samaria through Judea and out from there to people beyond the area, to people who were part of the Roman Empire, a Roman leader. And so now all the people there have been called to share in the faith. The church continues to grow. The Acts of the Apostles are saying, how did this community grow? How did this community live? How did this community develop? So we've come this far, and continuing next week, we'll see now what happens when the Peter has to go back and explain why he went into the home of a Gentile, because this was considered unclean by those who were Jews and the early Christian community up to this point still consider themselves faithful Jews. So next week we'll continue with the Acts of the Apostles. May the light of Christ lead me, the power of Christ be with me, the wisdom of Christ inspire me. The word of Christ instruct me. The shelter of Christ protect me. The hand of Christ hold me. The love of Christ be with me. May the grieving find support in me. Sad find joy in me. The depressed find hope in me. The weak find strength in me. The doubters find faith in me. The rejected find love in me. And the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.